It's, it's really an honor and a privilege to be introducing um, Dr. Jessica Payne today, who's um, a good friend of mine I've known for over 10 years. Um, and she's also an incredibly gifted and creative experimental psychologist and neuroscientist, as well as an amazing ambassador for science and great science communicator. So I'm thrilled that she accepted the invitation today to present her work. Um, just before I give a formal introduction, I just ask that everyone please uh, mute their Zoom and turn off their cameras. Um, if there are any questions during the talk, um, you're welcome to send them over the chat. And um, then uh, we'll stop and, have, and ask them if it's a matter of clarification, but generally prefer that you hold questions to the end. Um, we can, and then if you can write your questions in the chat window, um, I'll read them, I'll moderate the discussion uh, with Dr. Payne. So um, Jessica Payne received her PhD from the University of Arizona in psychology and cognitive neuroscience um, with her advisor, Lynn Nadell, before going on to a postdoctoral fellowship um, at Harvard University, where she worked with both Dan Schachter and Bob Stickold, really at the convergence of memory and sleep research. And it was in 2009 that Dr. Payne joined the faculty of the University of Notre Dame, or as they stay in Indiana, Notre Dame, the home of the Fighting Irish. And uh, she was promoted to associate professor in 2014. And she currently holds the Andrew McKenna Family Collegiate Chair in her Department of Psychology. Jessica Payne is a member of the prestigious International Neuropsychological Symposium, as well as the Memory Disorders Research Society. She's an associate editor of the Journal of Experimental Psychology General and the editor in chief of a new journal, um, the Journal of Experimental Results in Psychology and Psychiatry, which is released by Cambridge University Press. Um, Jess Payne's work has been very widely recognized over the years for its innovation. Um, and her career trajectory has been noted by the International Neuropsychological Society, where she received the CIRMAC Early Career Award. She, in 2015, received the Early Career Award from the Psychonomic Society. And very recently, in 2017, uh, the, she was named a Kavli Fellow from the National Academy of Sciences. So I think all of this speaks, again, to the really innovative and creative work that uh, Dr. Payne is doing. And I'll turn it over to her, um, presenting on stress, sleep, and emotional memory consolidation. So thank you so much for being here today, Jess. We look forward to your talk. Well, and thank you for having me, Nathan. I'm really delighted that you've invited me. This is probably the most academic thing I've done in the last two months. So it's a real pleasure and privilege to join you today to talk about uh, stress, sleep, and the consolidation of our emotional memories. I think something that's particularly relevant right now. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the interactive roles of sleep and stress in emotional memory consolidation. But I want to begin the talk by saying that at this point, Numerous labs have shown that both stress and sleep can independently enhance the consolidation of our emotional memories. And that tends to happen above and beyond neutral information. So this is true for a whole host of different types of stimuli. This is true for verbal narrative stimuli, for words, for images, but, oops, let me see if I can advance my slide. Okay, here we go. But we've been trying in our lab to take this story a step further and argue that sleep and stress can actually selectively benefit just the emotional features or aspects of our complex emotional experiences. And that's not necessarily the case for the neutral information that's a part of those experiences, which tends to decay or deteriorate at a completely different rate. So they really have different trajectories. Um, we think this issue of selectivity in memory um, in general, but also in emotional memory is a really important one because we've known for a long time that our emotional memories aren't stored in a uniform matter. Uh, instead, they're complex and uneven, and they seem to be subject to what are known as trade-off effects. And by that, I simply mean that emotionally central information tends to be exceptionally well remembered, but that often happens at the expense of neutral information in the background. So one real world example of this is called the weapons focus effect, um, which is, God forbid, if somebody were to jump out at you um, and put a gun in your face, which unfortunately 
<laughs> can happen here in the United States, um, but any type of weapon really, you may later find yourself having a hard time remembering the features in the background of that experience, but you'd have exceptionally good memory for the weapon, or in this case, the gun. And that is real world. I mean, it's something that frustrates law enforcement officials because after people experience an attack, they'll often have really good memories for the details of the weapon, but at the expense of even important information in the background, including the perpetrator's face, uh, which obviously makes these um, suspects difficult to identify. So that's a real world phenomenon. It's also been shown many times in the lab. Um, now, when it comes to studying these types of trade-offs in emotional memory, we know that they, from a memory perspective, they emerge very early on, um, after just a very brief delay immediately following encoding. And a lot of people think that it's really all about encoding, you know, that you attend much more to the emotional, salient, emotionally salient features of a scene or of an experience. And that's why you know, more emotional information gets in from the get-go, which is why later when you test these memories, you, you see this emotional memory enhancement effect at the expense of those neutral backgrounds. But we were interested in the evolution of these emotional memories or what kind of trajectory would the different features of these complex memories take across different types of consolidation delays. Um, and so the first study I'm gonna talk about is a sleep experiment where we were asking whether the components of emotional memories would evolve in the same way if you sort of slept on an emotional experience right after encountering it, or um, you know whether that it would look the same as wakefulness. So, <clears throat> so this first experiment I'll talk about is a sleep experiment. And to test this idea, we created scenes like these um, where we took either negative objects like the, the car wreck that you see here, um, or neutral ones like the intact car. And we embedded those objects on what I wanna stress was always a completely neutral background. So it's really the foreground object that determines the overall emotionality of the scene. Um, and so these scenes were viewed as just completely intact at the time of encoding. But then when people came back and were, were tested on them, we tested their memories for the objects and the background separately and one at a time. And we did this so we could get a sense of how the different components or features of these scenes might evolve in memory over time. And so in this initial experiment, we had four different groups. Um, we had two groups, which were circadian control groups, which were trained either at nine o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the evening, and then came back just 30 minutes later to have their memories tested. And that's just a time of day control and an important one. I wanna note that I've, I've actually never seen a difference, at least in college students, in terms of memory performance in the morning versus the evening. And so in almost all my exper experiments, I end up just collapsing those groups to get a little bit more power, since there really are no hints of differences. And then the two main groups, which also came in at either nine in the morning or nine in the evening, but they came back 12 hours later, okay? So the memories had a chance to incubate in a brain that was either asleep, for on average about seven and a half hours of that 12 hour delay or across a, a, a daytime period of wakefulness um, where no napping was allowed. So there was no sleep deprivation in this experiment. I tend not to love using sleep deprivation manipulations in my sleep research um, for reasons that will become clear in a moment, but sleep deprivation is very stressful and human subjects produce very high levels of stress hormones like cortisol when they have to endure it. So it's not, you can't really study the absence of sleep just by taking it away without getting into a whole nest of other confounding variables. So again, the, the, it was a 12 hour delay where you were either sleeping in the evening or remaining awake uh, throughout the day, which is why those circadian controls become important, showing that there was no memory performance differences between them. Um, so let me show you just statistically what the trade-off looks like. And this again is just after 30 minutes. This is before the sleep or the waking 12 hour delays. Uh, so what you can see here in terms of the, the number of items recognized um, <clears throat> is that when, when neutral consenes are being looked at, you have basically identical memory for both those neutral objects, like the intact car, and the background, like the street that it was sitting on. So no difference at all between objects and background memory when we're talking about the ability to retrieve features of the neutral scenes. But where you really start to see it um, is what happens when you look at the emotional scenes. So the complete trade-off statistically is, you know, you, your memory for these emotional objects is significantly better than your memory for the neutral objects. 
while the backgrounds on which they're placed, even though they're the same, is suppressed. So the interaction is significant, and so are both of these t-tests. So you see that you have an enhancement of uh, memory for the emotional objects, but at the expense of their backgrounds. And when, because we're talking about trade-offs, you, sort of, you can sort of eyeball the magnitude of that trade-off effect by looking at the distance between these two bars, okay, between the emotional object memory and the memory for their corresponding background. So that's what the trade-off looks like at just the 30-minute delay. Now we'll ask the question, all right, well, how do they evolve over time? So um, let's talk about the neutral scenes first. So here we are again, uh, back at just 30 minutes. This is what I showed you before, where there's no difference at all between the objects and backgrounds. And we'll ask ourselves what happens to these neutral scenes over time. Um, and what you see is that regardless of whether you spend that time asleep or awake, there's just no difference. Um, there's nothing exciting here at all. Sleep doesn't seem to care about, you know, these neutral scenes. In fact, you see about a 10% decline on average for both objects and backgrounds, regardless of whether you're in the, the wake or the sleep condition. So that's just for simple for getting over time. For the neutral scenes, nothing exciting at all. Where things get a little bit more exciting is when we start to look at what happens to the evolution of memory for these emotional scenes. So again, here we are at 30 minutes. We'll first look at what happens across that 12 hour waking delay, which again, is just simple forgetting. And again, it's about a 10% decline on average for both the objects and for the backgrounds. And what's interesting about this, when you're just looking at these data here, that idea that all of the sort of important um, processing happens at the time of encoding, that, that really, you know, maybe you're attending much more to those emotional objects, that much more gets in. And now over time, it's almost as if the memory has been sort of fused together at the time of encoding, and now it just deteriorates in a unitized fashion. Um, and, and you can see that the, the magnitude of the trade-off is, is actually identical here. Again, there's a 10% decline. So it really does add a little bit of credibility to that idea that most of what goes on goes on at encoding. And now you just get overall deterioration or forgetting, but in a unitized fashion, as if everything was fused together at the time of encoding, and now the memory is just deteriorating. That's what it looks like after a 12-hour delay of wakefulness, but let's look at what happens after sleep. So looking at the backgrounds first, nothing at all. In fact, they look identical uh, to the weight group. But now look at what happens to memory for the emotional objects, like the crashed car. So here, right away, you can see that the magnitude of this trade-off is much, much greater than it was either uh, at the 12-hour waking delay or even at the 30 minutes delay. So what's pretty remarkable here is these, this selective memory for emotional objects, for these negative emotional objects like that car crash, is actually better than not only after the 12 hour waking delay, but even after the 30 minute delay. So this is why we think sleep really does seem to be selectively consolidating or selectively prioritizing just the emotional information at the expense of everything else, because sleep does not confer the same benefit on the backgrounds that were associated with these emotional memories. So if anything, this makes it look like sleep is almost unbinding the memory so that it can really shine the light on or prioritize just this emotional information at the expense of everything else. Um, so it does look like there's some divergence in memory for the two parts of these emotional scenes. Now I've been talking about sleep uh, as if it's a unitary, unitary thing, but we know that's not the case. Um, sleep consists of completely different brain states. Uh, actually, you know, slow wave sleep um, is a totally different animal. A, a stage like rapid eye movement sleep has more in common than wakefulness than it does with slow wave sleep. So if you're wondering, well, what about sleep is it that's so important for the selective processing of these emotional memories, at least in our overnight designs, we have pretty good evidence that it's rapid eye movement sleep. So you can see here that there's a very strong correlation between people's abilities, again, selectively, to remember these negative objects as a function of how much time they spend in rapid eye movement sleep during the night. And I should mention that that was the only correlation we saw. There were no correlations uh, for the, the backgrounds, for the neutral memories. It really was uh, highly selective here. So sleep can clearly selectively benefit the emotional features of our emotional experiences, but as it turns out, so can stress. So can exposure to stress hormones like cortisol and norepinephrine. And so in this next study, I'll shift gears and show you what happens if instead of positioning 
a period of sleep right after you encode a bunch of emotional and neutral scenes like this. Instead, you subject people to a stressor. So it's the same trade-off task um, with the um, you know, neutral or negative objects on the neutral backgrounds. But now, instead of having people go to sleep right away after encoding, we're subjecting them to a, a, a stressor. And that stressor is the Trier Social Stress Test, which was developed in Germany. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's an evaluated public speech, basically. And it's highly stressful for most human participants, particularly if they're freshmen in college. And to get to the data, we, we pretty much show the same thing. So when you look at the impact of stress on the neutral scenes, you see that there's really not much going on here at all between the stress and the control group. But when you look at the negative scenes, again, you see this magnification of the trade-off effect with stress really having an impact only on those emotionally negative objects, but not on their paired backgrounds. So this is where things began to get interesting to me. And I should mention that, you know, Nathan mentioned that I got my PhD at the University of Arizona with Lynn Nadell, where we were very interested on, um, in the impact of stress on memory binding and on, you know, stress effects on emotional versus neutral information. And then I really switched gears and went and started working on uh, sleep-based consolidation effects. And this is where I, I guess I started to wonder if I could put it all together. Because what's interesting about this is that this study, and in fact, all of the studies I've, I've conducted in the past, and literally every study I know of in the human literature that looks at the impact of stress on long-term memory and shows these highly selective emotional memory benefits, occurs across uh, at least a 24-hour delay. And in fact, including some of the studies I've done in the past, sometimes it'll be more like a week or two weeks but they're really long delays and they all seem to span at least 24 hours when they show this selective emotional enhancement. And you might be asking yourself already, well, what do all 24 hour periods have in common? They have sleep in common. And so to me, this raised the question of whether sleep might be necessary for these stress-based effects to emerge, or at least whether the presence of sleep would be optimal for such effects to be at their strongest. Um, and I'll just mention that this is also a newer study. Stress also helps subjects with memory precision for these negative objects. Um, so in a recent study that was conducted by my former PhD student, Tony Cunningham, who's also now at Harvard, uh, working with Bob Stickle, he showed that stress not only helped with target recognition specifically for negative items in this task, but he also showed that it helped participants accurately discriminate between studied negative objects and really similar ones. Um, and he also has evidence for the well-known inverted U-shaped curve um, for this ability to discriminate between similar negative items with moderate levels of cortisol helping, but cortisol levels that are either too low or too high actually hurting discrimination. And that's particularly the case when you get to very high levels of cortisol here. Uh, and this paper also tests memory after a 24-hour delay, where again, you're seeing that selective benefit for just the the negative objects in terms of people's ability to discriminate. Okay, so given this you know, need for at least 24 hours in terms of the retention interval, and given that we, we know that these enhancements by stress are, are, are they, they take time to become ingrained in the brain, we asked whether a sleep delay would be better at solidifying these memories than a waking delay, okay? So again, we're sort of back to the 12, 12 hour thing because that's about as far as you can go if you're not gonna use sleep deprivation. So all of this I think raises the question, does, does stress and arousal, does its presence at the time of initial encoding somehow set the stage for selective emotional memory consolidation that we, knows happen, that we know happens during subsequent sleep? Is there any evidence that sleep and stress might interact to influence emotional memory consolidation or more specifically, might elevations in stress-related neuromodulators around, again, around the time of that encoding event, may they somehow be important for these downstream sleep-based consolidation effects? Or in other words, would stress and arousal during learning set the stage for these selective emotional memory consolidation effects uh, during subsequent sleep? So in this last experiment I'll talk about today, um, we tried to combine the two and we asked whether higher levels of the stress hormone cortisol, which you can very easily measure in human subjects out of the saliva, uh, whether higher levels of the stress hormone cortisol 
at the time of encoding, um, would that facilitate memory for these emotional more than neutral um, stimuli? Um, and would this enhancing effect of a cortisol on consolidation be more pronounced if then participants slept rather than remained awake after encoding? And again, it's the same trade-off task. I guess that's kind of what's nice about this is we're using the exact same task for, for all of these studies. Um, so again, people are encoding these intact scenes with negative neutral objects on neutral backgrounds. They come back and this time they retrieve the information in the scanner, um, but following a period of sleep versus a period of wakefulness. And for the sake of time, because we're beginning to run a little low, I'm only going to focus on memory for uh, the objects. And I'm just going to show you the two findings that I consider to be the most important and the most interesting from this uh, fairly complex experiment. And the first one involves cortisol. Um, so as you can see here, what we see is that higher levels of cortisol, again, at the time of encoding, predict better memory for these negative objects. But critically, that's only the case in the sleep group, as you can see here. Uh, we don't see a significant correlation in the weight group, nor do we see it for neutral memory in either group. So again, it's, it's highly selective. <clears throat> and I think just as interestingly, we find that sleep participants with higher cortisol at the time of encoding show retrieval-related activity in known emotional processing regions when they later retrieve these emotional objects. And as you can see, that activity is centered on the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. But what's so interesting about this are these are like nearly identically the same regions um, as ones that we found in a prior paper where, again, using the same task, we were asking you know, what brain regions come online to help you retrieve these memories for these negative emotional objects uh, following sleep and wakefulness. And as you can see here, following sleep, we had basically the exact same region. So after wakefulness, you know, it was sort of your typical memory retrieval network, but after a period of sleep, it was this much more refined and restricted network centered on the, the amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Um, and we see the same thing here. The only difference is in that, is in this 2011 study, we never measured cortisol. So I guess to, to conclude um, in terms of what we're thinking, uh, cortisol during encoding leads to a stronger memory trace for negative objects, but only if sleep occurs during the consolidation interval. And I, th I think you can think of sleep as really optimizing consolidation. Um, this is consistent with prior literature showing an enhancing effect of cortisol exposure and stress during learning on emotional memory, but I think it builds on it in a very important way because it, it might attribute the enhancing effects of cortisol on long-term emotional memory to consolidation that happens specifically during sleep. You know, sleep might really be necessary. And this supports this burgeoning idea in my mind that elevations in cortisol and especially in other arousal-related neuromodulators like norepinephrine may help tag these encoded memories as important to remember, again, at the time of learning, which then those tags sort of, you know, tells the sleeping brain sort of where to look and enables these unique sleep-based consolida consolidation processes to, to selectively solidify that information and not other information. Um, now, I'm making a big deal about cortisol here. Some of you may be thinking, well, how on earth could that help with tagging? Because, you know, cortisol is such a sluggish response, and that's true. So it may do something to the background neurobiological milieu that makes these tags easier to set. Um, but another stress and arousal related neurotransmitter is norepinephrine. And I think that is fast enough to actually tag these individual memories and these individual features of memories. So unfortunately we can't look at norepinephrine directly in humans, but we can look at a couple of proxy measures for it. So in another study, again, using the same task, uh, we looked at some measures like skin, skin conductance and what's fascinating here is we see that same pattern as I showed you for cortisol earlier. Um, so you see a very similar relationship between, again, this highly selective emotional memory consolidation, um, but this time we see it with skin conductance response. So we didn't measure cortisol here because it was a separate study, um, but again, we see that only in the sleep group. So I find that pretty fascinating because skin conductance, you know, is driven mostly by the sympathetic nervous system. So, I mean, again, it's not as good as having you know, direct information about, about norepinephrine, but it, it's suggested at least. And uh, we, also, we also looked at heart rate deceleration and we saw the same thing. Um, 
heart rate deceleration is an orienting response or dip in your heart rate when you orient to something and it tends to be bigger if you're shown an emotional stimulus rather than a neutral one. And it's kind of this orienting thing before your heart rate spikes. Um, and we actually showed that the same thing was true there, but again, that was only the case in the sleep group. So it seems that elevations in several neuromodulators associated with stress and arousal around the time of encoding may be helping to tag specific parts of a memory um, for later processing. Uh, and again, I want to remind you that I, I, you know, we're really trying to get beyond just sleep or even just REM sleep in terms of trying to understand what is it about the, the neurophysiology of the sleeping brain that may be beneficial to memory processing. Um, current graduate student Sarah Kim uh, just published this in Hippocampus, actually, and she's showing that it's not just sleep that's beneficial for this highly selective emotional memory consolidation, and it's not just REM sleep either, but actually within rapid eye movement sleep, it seems to be theta power. So theta is sort of the dominant ry rhythm um, of, associated with rapid eye movement, and what you're seeing here is that rapid eye movement sleep theta power predicts emotional memory in the stress condition, okay? Um, and that's especially the case for people who are high responders to that Trier social stress test. Now, what's interesting about that particular task, I don't know if anybody here has used it, but it's, it's pretty stressful. I mean, most participants will subjectively report being stressed by that task, but we also know that in any given experiment, around 20%, sometimes even, they just won't mount a cortisol response to it. And so um, it's kind of a you know crude and, particularly statistically savvy way to look at it. But if we just, you know, we, see, we already see the relationship here in the stress group overall, and then this relationship between theta power and emotional memory becomes even, you know, more pronounced if you're just looking at people who actually are a responder to the stress manipulation in terms of output. Um, and I just mentioned that we don't see this relationship at all um, in the context or even in the weak cortisol responders to the stress exposure. So I'll go ahead and end today um, with a model that I'm working on and beginning to try to test in which I'm thinking about how stress and sleep may interact to selectively benefit the emotional components of our experience. And so one idea is that elevated cortisol and elevations and other arousal related neuromodulators like norepinephrine that we know are active around the time of encoding um, enhance the functioning of the amygdala hippocampus uh, prefrontal cortical network. And I should mention that in my hands, it doesn't really seem to matter whether we put the stress just before encoding or just afterward. It seems to be able to act both forward and backward in time. And so as long as it's close to that initial encoding event, uh, we see the same downstream effects provided the delay is at least 24 hours or more. Um, but the idea is that specifically these neuromodulators help set tags for subsequent sleep-based processing. And I really do mean molecular tags, which of course is hard to think about in humans, but as you know, the concept of a tag seeks to explain how neural signaling creates a target for subsequent plasticity-related products, or PRPs, that we know are essential for sustained and selective plasticity in neural circuits. So the idea is that perhaps cortisol and norepinephrine and other neuromodulators are somehow helping to potentiate these specific synapses at the time of learning. Then they're set, and then the high frequency, the highly unique, high frequency stimulation that occurs during sleep, you know, in the form of the theta rhythm, sleep spindles, you know, we hippocampal sharp wave uh, ripple complexes, the, all of these sleep related events that we know are important for memory consolidation. It may be that, that, that those actually, I don't know really know how to say this, but they actually somehow zap that tag and sort of turn this sort of short lasting uh, synaptic reverberation or consolidation effect into a much longer lasting system wide consolidation effect of the type that we tend to talk about in human neuroscience studies when we're using techniques like neuroimaging. Um, and so it may be that, they, that, the, that those high frequency bursts of sim stimulation that are so, so characteristic and unique to sleep uh, may help maintain that plasticity in the long run. So, I mean, I'd love to get feedback on this. I, I think I'm headed into a situation where I'm just not gonna be able to test some features of this model in, in human subjects. Uh, I think we may need to go to animal models. Um, but in terms of sort of general questions that I um, left thinking about, uh, you know, the big one is how on earth do memories get prior prioritized by the sleeping brain? I think memory selectivity 
And um, memory prioritization is a really interesting topic even outside of the emotional memory domain. Uh, in terms of how the brain does that, I think it's a fascinating question. Um, is some type of subnaptive tagging mechanism involved and might this be enhanced by these types of neuromodulators that we know are active during times of arousal and stress? Uh, and if so, how might we understand the relationship between the synaptic consolidation that I spend a lot of time reading about in animals and then the, the systems consolidation that we tend to talk about in the sleep and memory domain in humans? And bridging, bridging those two worlds is really what I'm fascinated um, to try to do, to try to figure out when people talk about you know, sleep in terms of synaptic consolidation, how does that relate to the systems consolidation that, we, that we're talking about in humans? And, and, and might stress uh, and sleep somehow relate the two of them? Um, so I think I'm in about 30 minutes in. I'll go ahead and stop there. Again, I wanna thank um, the organizers and thank you so much, Nathan, for inviting me. I think Nathan knows I'm a little intellectually starved these days, so this has been great. Um, and I'd love to get feedback on the work. I'll just leave, leave you with some acknowledgement. Um, Kelly Bennion, Tony Cunningham, and Sarah Kim are graduate students who led the work here. And then just want to shout out to all of my collaborators uh, and funding sources. So thank you very much. All right, Jess, thank you so much for your talk. That was wonderful. Um, it's, it's, I could have heard much, much more. I'm sure there's more. Um, <laughs> At some point, I, I look forward to hearing this. This is great. Um, I have some questions, but we're already getting some from the crowd, so I'll, I'll read those out to you. The only thing we miss on the virtual is really that round of applause you get at the end where we express our gratitude for your work. <laughs> I'm sure it's I, I, I live with the dopamine surge for now. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. All right. So Roni Seaton asked, um, so you presented results for memory enhancement of negative emotional stimuli compared to neutral following sleep and stress. Are similar enhancements observed for positive emotional stimuli, or are they unique to, emotion, to negative emotionally laden events? It's such a great question, and I guess the true answer is I don't know yet. I thought I knew, so we, we, we essentially replicate the effects if we use positive stimuli instead of negative stimuli, but they're just a little watered down. Truthfully, I think that's more about the stimuli themselves. So if, especially if you're trying to take this to fMRI, you know, you need so many of these stimuli. And if you think about it, it's hard to find, you know, a sufficient number of truly highly arousing uh, positive uh, memories, uh, positive images, because we really think this is driven by arousal, not, not balance per se. And so, you know, of course, in our real lives, there are plenty of highly arousing positive um, events. But when you try to find a whole bunch of pictures to use in this type of study, it's, it's, re, it's you know, either puppies and, you know, a cake could be really arousing for some people, but typically we just can't equate the arousal in a way that's satisfactory to me. I mean, at least as far as when you look at like GSR and you try to equate them on something other than just subjective ratings. So I think that's part of it. But what I did want to mention actually, if I can go back to this image, is that these data, I've collapsed actually emotional here, but this, this study, this is the only study that used a, a slightly different task where we had, um, it wasn't a trade-off task at all, it was just positive, um, neutral, and negative images. And then we did retrieve a little bit differently where we had people look at just like incomplete line drawings, um, so as not to sort of reinstantiate another encoding event. Probably still kind of does, but, um, and, in this case, the positive, at least in terms of this REM theta power finding, the positive um, images drove this result a little bit better and a little bit more than the negative. And this is a different task. So it may be that we, you know, that we, because in the trade-off task, you're also constrained by, you know, you're trying to put objects on a plausible background, right? Like that car crash versus an intact car on a street, you know, or a chipmunk versus a snake in a forest. But you, you very quickly run out of plausible, you know, plausible positive objects to put on backgrounds. And so this one removed that constraint and we got a little better data. So I think, so this one makes me wonder if we just haven't looked at that enough. Because, it, you know, everything I want to say about stress and emotional memory really should be dri driven mostly by arousal. Um, and so just from a pure theory perspective, I'd probably expect to see it in both. Although from an evolutionary perspective, I think it, it may be just a little stronger for, for the negative. All right, great, thank you. So Julian Diana asks, have you looked at the possible role of NREM sleep in this type of memory? Uh, we have actually, and here's where it gets completely wonky. So in the overnight studies where we're looking at sleep across a full night of sleep, uh, 
REM really does seem to tell the stronger story when you mix emotional with neutral stimuli. If it's just neutral stimuli, then you see a much more you know, clear non-REM slow wave sleep type story. When we move this to a nap design, now there, are, you know, we usually give people an hour and a half nap, you know, um, opportunity, which is barely one ultradian cycle. They don't get a whole lot of REM, so, you know, may, but we there start to see. And I'll just go back to this particular effect. This guy should be some easier way to do this, but um, we basically see this exact same thing, but with slow wave sleep on the x-axis there, um, and delta power. So it it may. Maybe that the sleeping brain kind of uses whatever it has. And in an overnight design, we tend to see these REM effects. Um, in a nap design, we see slow wave sleep effects. I, I'm increasingly getting kind of sick of these conventional REM versus non-REM distinctions. For those of you that have staged sleep before, you're looking at a 30 second epic. And you know if more than half of it is slow wave sleep, you call it slow wave sleep, but you're just, you're dumping a lot of information. There's also a huge amount of individual variation going on in terms of say spindling or um, spindle slow wave coupling, even if somebody has the exact same amount of non-REM sleep. So I think, you know, the field rightly so is beginning to get away from this simple REM versus non-REM, you know, dichotomy type of distinctions and beginning to really try to understand the sleeping brain from, uh, you know, an underlying neurophysiological perspective instead. So I hope that answered your question. If not, please circle back. All right. Well, Julian says he completely agrees with you. So I believe okay. so. All right. Um, Amanda LaRosa is asking, have you looked at PTSD or depression groups? So, you know, I'm cross-listed as a clinical and uh, cognitive uh, brain and behavior professor at Notre Dame. One of the reasons I accepted the job, there were two major depression researchers here. And I've mentored Tony Cunningham is actually a clinical student who's now trying to do that very thing. Um, out at Harvard Medical School. Um, we've looked at it, but in a way that's not satisfactory. So we've looked at not PTSD at all. We have looked at subclinical depression, but you know, not having done structured clinical interviews, just relying on um, you know, like the Beck depression inventory and things like that. We do find actually some pretty conflicting data at this point, um, with some suggesting actually that these effects are even more pronounced in depression. And I do sometimes give a clinical talk where I, what I usually say in both PTSD and depression, you know, I think that this selective prioritization of negative emotional memories is actually a good thing. I think it's adaptive. I think if even on an individual basis, you couldn't remember the negative things that happened to you, you'd be in big trouble. And I think at a species level, uh, we'd be extinct. So I do think that this hyper-focus on the negative is beneficial up to a point, up to a point. But then what's adaptive can very quickly become maladaptive if you are suffering some of the cognitive issues like rumination that are associated with depression, the sleep state changes, which are really marked actually in depression, sleep architecture changes a lot. So another long range goal of the lab is to really try to understand the changes in cognition, you know, everything from problems with detailed memory to excessive emotional memory biases and emotional processing biases to changes in the stress response system that happens in both PTSD and depression, which you know those are quite distinct. Um, and then the sleep architecture alterations in both of those conditions and trying to put together a story there that makes sense. Um, you know, I think it's probably multi-causal. For me, it would just be what's the best place to intervene and try to do a therapeutic treatment. I just think there's a lot, to, lot of work that needs to happen um, looking at potential interventions on the sleep and stress front um, that could help treat some of these clinical conditions. But I guess that's a long way of saying that I think I have to wait for Tony um, to for a while to get you know data that I can really believe in to have a better response to that question. All right, thanks. So I have a question. I'm wondering how much you've looked at uh, or what you think the impact would be on the time to sleep. So you show that there's you know a standard decay of of the memory trace after 12 hours, but you know after those people sleep, um, do they benefit? From, do they have that same boost after they get those those hours of consolidation um, during during sleep? Yeah. Um, and how does that play out over like three days or or a week or so? That's that's such a good question. That's another study that Tony's running right now in collaboration with Jan Born's group in Germany. Um, what's interesting is that we know that again, if you're just looking at straight up episodic memory, neutral episodic memory, it really has to pretty quickly follow encoding. 
in a lab design though, right? So, I mean, even in these cases, these students are going to, I mean, they're being tested at nine. They're probably out of the lab by 1030. God only knows when they go to bed. You know, we actually have looked at that um, delayed asleep, but there's not much going on there. Uh, in the real world though, you know, if something truly emotional happens to you, I think the brain's going to stamp it and tag it, and it's still going to care about it two or three days down the road. So it's a hard question to answer on two fronts. I mean, one, it's just a difficult study to run in terms of compliance, but um, you know, it's, it's just, again, coming back to these stimuli, I just don't know that they're salient enough to last over a longer time frame. And so I think until we figure that out, it's, it's, it's a bit confounded by, you know, by the materials that we're, we're allowed to use without completely, you know, traumatizing people. But I think we need something much more emotionally arousing than looking at snakes, you know, in a desert okay. in order to ask answer that question. Have you thought about looking at sort of more of like an autobiographical memory re-experiencing of this stress event itself? So when students are giving this like, you know, impromptu sort of talk, have you then had them recall those events and maybe like score the details? We actually haven't done that yet, but that's a really, really good idea. We just launched, it's purely online at this point, but we just launched a COVID-19 um, study where we'll be able to pick up on a little bit of that. But then of course we don't have them in the lab. We can't look at their, you know, their PSG recorded sleep. But I, th I think it's a great question. I suspect that the brain is gonna work on, I mean, so to take traumatic memories or even just really emotional memories, the brain is gonna be working on those across several days. You're gonna be thinking about it during the day for, I mean, think about a breakup or something like that. You'll ruminate about that for sometimes up to a year or more. I think, I mean, really, I think in part what sleep's doing is it's reflecting what you are processing. And so getting participants to care about these lab-based studies is really the problem there. But that's why I think the autobiographical idea is a good route to take. All right. Okay, so we have another question. Um, there's been evidence that animals, sorry. There's been evidence in animals that dopamine could enhance consolidation by enhancing reactivation of rewarded memories during non-REM sleep. How do you think this could interact with the norepinephrine stress enhancements of negative stimuli? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that research is fascinating. And I think, you know, what it is, is that, I mean, so there you are kind of getting into more of a positive, a positive memory bias that you're, you know, the rewarding stimuli that they're looking at. Um, and I think it may be that any of these neurotransmitters or neuromodulators can kind of, you know, do the same thing in terms of tagging these memories and creating extra plasticity. I think what would be fascinating is if you could somehow selectively show that you know, norepinephrine would do it for an arousing or stressful event, whereas dopamine would do it for a rewarding one. If you could do that within the same experiment, that would be amazing. But again, it's in humans, it's, it's very difficult to, to do that work. So whoever asked that question, if you're somebody who wants to collaborate, let me know. Because I, th I just think it's a fascinating question. You know, I think that a lot of these neurotransmitters can probably operate in the same way. And they may be you know, sort of identifying different content as important. All right, so we have a follow-up. Um, I want to ask you about the stimuli arousal issue too. Do you think that the human facial expression is sufficient mm -hmm. to evoke this emotional selectivity in memory consolidation during human sleep? Uh, have you seen studies that show the similar result using negative face image stimuli? You know, I haven't seen that study. I'm not sure it exists. That's another really good idea. Um, what I like about that is you could act, at least you can actually do some EMG work too, because sometimes people will reflect those same facial expressions. Um, I actually do, I'm not aware of a study that's, look, that's looked at that, but I think that's maybe another way. Um, but then I guess going back to the same issue with getting in enough stimuli, would it be, uh, and I haven't worked with these types of stimuli before, so truthfully, I don't know, but would it be that even though you have a whole bunch of different people making, you know, angry or, or, you know, disgusted or, you know, fearful faces, you know, would that continue to work? I don't know what memory is like, the specificity of memory would be like for the, for the memory for those faces down the line. I also don't know, does the response kind of die out over time? Like if you keep seeing them over and over again, you know, does the response kind of die down as you get, as you get yourself into the experiment? I don't know that much about the, um, that particular design. But I think it's potentially really interesting if you can make the, the faces somehow 
different enough that they'd be silly enough to remember that might be another good way of generating an emotional response and differentiating different types of arousing memories versus not arousing memories from each other. All right. Okay, do we have any other questions um, from people in the audience? All right, Jess, thank you so much. All right, well, thank you everybody for being here. I love it, I mean, though there are 51 of you out there, well, I can see Nathan, but that's it. Uh, thank you so much, this has been great. Anybody wants to follow up with me via, via email, um, I'm really looking for collaborators with this work. You know, we're, I'm still doing my scanning at Harvard, uh, and like I said, I think a lot of these questions need an animal model to be sufficiently answered. So thank you very much. And thanks again, right. Ethan. Well, thank you again so much for sharing this. This has just been a wonderful addition to the talk series and um, look forward to, to hearing more about the work soon. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody.